Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the laws for the priests. That's Leviticus chapters 8 through 10 in our study of the book of Leviticus. Our outline for Leviticus, we started with laws of offering, chapters 1 through 7, uh, laws of priests, what we're going to look at now, uh, laws of purity, day of atonement, more laws of holiness or purity, more laws of priests in chapters 21 through 22, uh, appointed times, and then finally penalties and vows. In the laws of the offering, chapters 1 through 5, we, we looked at the various types, five major types of offerings, and then we partitioned over to the, the priest part in those offerings, chapters 6 and 7, and now we transition nicely to the laws for the priesthood itself. The biblical priesthood uh, is first seen in Genesis chapter 14, where we have a priest, a king, who's also a priest, high priest by the name of Melchizedek. Uh, he comes sort of out of the pages of history. You know, we see him briefly and then disappears again. We don't know where he came from, where he went after this, but he was both priest and king in Jerusalem. Uh, likewise, Jethro, uh, who is introduced to us in Exodus chapter 2, verse 16, also goes by the name of Ruel. Uh, he's the priest of Midian. And again, he's a priest outside of the uh, of the priesthood of Aaron and the Aaronic priesthood that we see later on in the Old Testament. Now, th finally we come in the book of Exodus to the priesthood of Aaron, and that's where we're looking at now. Um, of course, we have a great high priest in the New Testament. We have Jesus, who in a sense has his priesthood looking back at all those others. Uh, we have Psalm chapter 101. Uh, ten that speak about how he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, but we see certain commonalities with all of these in Jesus because he is our great high priest. In the Cornerstone Commentary, it talks about how chapters 8 through 10 in Leviticus appear to form a narrative in the midst of a record of regulations. It's not the case, however, that stories interrupted laws, but rather the reverse. The stories show the circumstances that give birth to the laws, providing living flesh and sinews to the legal bones. So w most of Leviticus is going to be the setting forth of law, but here in this section, we're actually going to see some some historical narrative come to the forefront and it will be because of that narrative that will give the reason for the laws that follow leviticus chapter 8 verse 1 then the lord spoke to moses saying take aaron and his sons with him and the garments and the anointing oil and the bowl of the sin offering and take the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread and assemble all the congregation at the doorway of the tent so Moses did just as the Lord commanded him. When the congregation was assembled at the doorway of the tent of meeting, Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded to do. Then Moses had Aaron and his sons come near and washed them with water. There's a, a, a cleansing for preparation of this. They are to be washed. The Septuagint translates this washing with the Greek word luo, that they are to be loosed with water. He put the tunic on him, and girded him with a sash, and clothed him with a robe, and put the ephod on him, that is, he's dressing him in the garments of the high priest, and girded him with the artistic band of the ephod uh, with, with which he tied it to him. He then placed, placed the breastpiece on him, and in the breastpiece he put the urim and the thummim, the lights and the perfections, we rendered that. The lights and the perfections. He also placed the turban on his head, and on the turban at its front he placed the golden plate, the holy crown, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses then took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them so that the tabernacle is set apart for the priest and the priest is set apart for the tabernacle and they're both set apart for that place of meeting God. He anoints it. Meshach, and remember we, uh, one of the titles we give for to Jesus is the Messiah, the Messiah, the anointed one. And he consecrated, he, uh, Kadash, he made it holy. Then he poured some of the anointed oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Psalms, chapter 133 looks back to this event. 
Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edges of his robe. Likewise, Isaiah chapter 61 talks about the anointing this, where the prophet says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And remember, Jesus read this particular passage in his synagogue at Nazareth. And he said, Today this is being fulfilled in your hearing. He is the ultimate fulfillment of the anointed one. Well, next, Moses had Aaron's son come, uh, sons come near and clothed them with tunics and girded them with sashes and bound caps on them just as the Lord had commanded Moses. They are to be priests as well. Then he brought the bull of the sin offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull offering. Next, Moses slaughtered it and took the blood and with his finger put some of it around it on the horns of the altar and purified the altar. Then he poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. He has to atone these priests because they are sinners just like everyone else. You see, there's only one high priest that, that never needed an atonement for himself, and that was Jesus, who was without sin. Then he presented the second ram, the ram of the ordination, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and Moses slaughtered it and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. That is the, the accruedments, the, the, the extensions of Aaron, his, his ear, his thumb, his big toe, and on the right of each one, because that's, that's the, the accruedment of cleanliness. He also had Aaron's son co sons come near, and Moses put some of the blood on the lobe of their right ear and on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot. Moses then sprinkled the rest of the blood around the altar. So Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood, which was on the altar, and sprinkled it on Aaron, on his garments, on his sons, on the garments of his sons with him. And he consecrated Aaron, his garments, and his sons, and the garments of his sons with him to make them holy, to set them apart for the special work of service. Then Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the doorway of the tent of meeting and eat it there together with the bread which is in the basket of the ordination offering, just like commanded, saying, Aaron is, and his sons shall eat it. The remainder of the flesh of the, of the bread you shall burn with fire. So what they don't eat there to br is to be burned up. That is, it's to be offered as a offering to the Lord. And they eat a meal with the Lord. You shall not go outside the doorway of the tent of meeting for seven days until the day that the period of your ordination is fulfilled. For he will ordain you through seven days. And so they go through this extended ordination service. The Lord has commanded to do as has been done this day to make atonement on your behalf. And this is all part of that service. At the doorway of the tent of meeting, moreover, you shall remain day and night for seven days and keep the charge of the Lord so that you will not die. For so I have been commanded thus Aaron and his sons did all the things which the Lord had commanded through Moses. They are being set apart in this very extended solemn ceremony. In the same way that God had created heaven and earth six days and then rested on the seventh, they are to take an entire seven days devoting themselves to the work of the Lord. So that in chapter 8, we have the instructions for the ordination of the priesthood. Then in chapter 9, we have a description of the opening ministry of these priests as they, as they first begin, now for the first time, to do their ministry. And in chapter 10, there's going to be judgment and replacing of the sinning priests who are struck dead by God for their wrongdoing. Well, chapter 9, verse 22, Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he stepped down after making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then fire came, down, came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. God shows up and God accepts the offering with fire. Now, that fire is going to be significant because of what takes place next. 
chapter 10, verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered, offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. You see, they were coming to worship God, but they were coming to worship God in a way they were deciding instead of the way that God had ordained. They were coming with little thought as to preparation instead of being reminded of the seven days that they'd been given over to preparation. And Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. You see, they weren't treating God in a serious way. They weren't treating him as holy. They were not treating him in the weighty manner that he deserved. How often do we do the same thing? Where we do not take the worship of the Lord as serious business. Well, we have the brothers who sin, the brothers, sons of Aaron, who sin. They are punished. That's in verses 1 through 5. And then Moses now gives instructions to the surviving priests, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord instructs Aaron. And then Moses again instructs the priests. Notice that where the Lord instructs Aaron, that's, that's the pivotal point. And now the two other sons, two other brothers, yes, they sin, but they're forgiven. So some lessons from the death of those first two sons, those first two brothers, from Nadab and Abihu. First of all, God must be worshipped as he ordains that he's to be worshipped. We are not free to make it up as we go. You know, there's a difference between uh, the traditions of Lutheranism versus Calvinism. Luther suggested uh, we're free to worship any way we want as long as it's not forbidden in Scripture. And Calvin, coming a bit later, he said, no, 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 we actually are mandated to worship God in specific ways in the Scripture, and we ought not to go beyond those. That means that obedience is better than sacrifice. And yet, it's the Lord who gave the sacrificial system, and yet what God wants first and foremost is obedience, is reality, not just ritual. And the presence of God can, can be either a curse or a blessing. If we're obedient to him, it is a blessing. But if we're rebellious, then the presence of God can be a curse. It's possible to do the right thing in the wrong way. It's right to, uh, to, to worship the Lord. It's right to honor him. And yet it's possible to, to worship and even try to honor God in a wrong way, in a way that is other than what he has dictated and determined. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 4, Moses called to Mishael the Elzaphan, and Elzaphan, the, the son's, of Aaron's uncle Uziel and said to them come forward carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary to the outside of the camp just like they did with the, the sin offering so they came forward and carried them still in their tunics to the outside of the camp as Moses had said then Moses said to Aaron and to his sons Eliezer and Ithamar these are the two younger sons the ones that are surviving do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes so that you will not die and that he will not become wrathful against all the congregations. In other words, don't do the things that normally go with mourning, but your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, shall bewail the burning which the Lord has brought about. The Lord then spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink. Maybe that's a hint. I'm not sure. Maybe that's a hint of what had caused that earlier disobedience. Do not drink wine or strong drink, either you or, nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, so that you will not die. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You take God seriously. And so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean, notice, holy 
versus profane, or or we could just say holy versus common, clean versus unclean, and so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. We're reminded of the New Testament where it warns us today, the spiritual priests of God, how we are not to be bound together with unbelievers. Paul asks, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we, we are the temple, now notice we collectively are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And if the sons of Aaron were cast down for being careless, how much more we who were both priests and the temple itself how much more ought we to take care in our worship and following of the Lord that we might be a holy temple unto God. Therefore, Paul says, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. We are called to be set apart for God. It doesn't mean we don't talk to unbelievers, but we don't live there any longer. We live with the Lord. 